welcome our online guests this morning. And we're going to start with worship today. Anybody ready to worship God? Yeah. Yeah.
not one of those times you deserved it.
Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's protect the other family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your healing, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your healing, Jesus. Thank you for your healing. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance or in honor of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death yes. until he comes. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're standing right there in the middle right now. Yeah. Come on, we're right there in the middle between death and until he comes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We look back at death because, at, because of his death, we have forgiveness. Yeah. Hallelujah. We have a brand new heart. Yeah. We have a hope of heaven. Yeah. Uh, we look forward that this is not it, that what he did on the cross has a forward focus. It has a future focus. Amen. It tells us he's coming back. Amen. He paid the price for us. And he's going to come and claim us to be his own. Aren't you glad for that? Hallelujah. Go ahead and take your hand. We're going to handle this. Shed blood this morning. Let's protect it. Lord Jesus, we thank you. And Lord, that it were not for your shed blood, we would have no hope. Lord God, we would have, Lord, no forgiveness. Lord, we would be lost, guilty, Lord, as charged, without any hope of spending heaven with you, or any hope of escaping our just deserved wrath from you. But Jesus, because you died in our place and you suffered the Father's wrath, we have forgiveness, we have cleansing of our sin, we have the hope of eternity with you. And I pray, Lord God, as we are reminded of that, as we worship and adore you, Lord God, and express our love and devotion to you this morning. Lord, that you would renew our inner man, Lord God. Strengthen us with the power, Lord God, that was opened up, Lord God, when you laid your life down on the cross. Lord, that we would live in fellowship, Lord, unhindered, unbroken fellowship with you. Take every sin, every compromise, Lord God, every stain, every obstacle, take it out of the way, that we might enjoy full fellowship with you. Thank you for it now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Let's go take it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, just let it down. Come on. Let it down. Come on. Hallelujah. Every stain, he's cleansed. Every sin obstacle is moving out of the way. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that this morning? I say, aren't you glad for that this morning, church? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's bless him. Let's worship him. Let's bless this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, just take a moment and say, bless him. And praise him. Give all that we should love.
grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, here it is, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering and with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. In verse 7 he says this, And so you became a model. Somebody say a model. model. Paul says, You Thessalonians, you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Wow. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Amen. A model church. Signs of true conversion. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the privilege of just being in your presence in your house here this morning. We thank you for the way you've already touched us, the way we've already were broken through and uh, in our lives, God, and reorientate our thoughts and our, and our desires. We thank you, Lord, for your strength. And Lord God, now as we look at your word, we pray that your word would find fertile soil in us. Lord, as we look into Lord, the transforming power of the gospel and the change that it brings, God, we would examine our hearts. We would see, Lord, and make sure that those changes are present in us. Lord, that you would examine us for true conversion. And so we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. This city of Thessalonica was a major city. Uh, it was a, a city about 100,000 or 200,000, probably twice the size of Inglewood, California. And it was on the crossing point of two major Roman highways, and it had a port. And so it was a very important city. And so God used Paul to plant and establish a church there. But before he could really put in the discipleship time that he wanted to, he was forced to leave that young congregation just with the, just with the basics of the gospel and a little bit of discipleship, and he had to trust them to the work of God. As he traveled around to different places, he found himself in Corinth, and he wanted to write a letter to them because he had received word that what was going on in Thessalonica, not only were they surviving, they were thriving. Yeah. Not only were they were thriving, but they had become a model to other churches that were much larger, much older, and he, it was all because the work of God had taken root in this congregation, and their salvation, their conversion was real. Amen. Amen. They exhibited the things that come with a true conversion. Amen. I think that's important that we just take note. We want to be a model church. We want to make sure that we are expressing a true conversion. Yes. Can I just tell you, there's a lot of people sitting in churches that have not experienced a true conversion. Yes. Come on. You can sit in church. You can sing songs. Amen. You can even give the offering and, offering and never have a life-changing personal experience called conversion yes. with Jesus Christ. And Paul doesn't want that to happen. And so he's checking what he wants to hear about these Thessalonians, and he hears that they are showing the signs of true life. What are those signs? Well, there's a couple. He points it out here in verse number three, and he gives the first of that great triad, triad, triad of Christian virtue. He said they have a faith that works. They have a faith that works. There it is in verse number three. He says, he says, we remember before our God and Father, and he said, said it here, your work, somebody say work. Work. Your work produced by faith. Now the gospel that Paul preached, it was a gospel of grace. Isn't that right? He did not preach a gospel that you had to somehow perform certain rituals and live up to all the standards of the law and somehow live up to a place of gaining 
God's favor and salvation. No, he said you can never uh, serve enough. You can never do enough good works in order to merit God's salvation and receive justification from God. He preached a message of grace, of gospel grace. Ephesians yeah. chapter 4, or chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Yeah. It is by grace you have been saved yeah. through faith. Yeah. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Yeah. Not by works, so that no one can boast. in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, it is through the law that we become conscious of our sin. Amen. But see, the faith that Paul is talking about, we need to make sure we understand it. It is a faith that is not something that is just an abstract idea for them to believe. That's not what he's talking about when he's talking about the faith that they have. The faith he's talking about is not even a set of doctrine or a body of doctrine teaching that they were to understand and defend. The faith that Paul is commending these Thessalonians for, it is an active, ongoing trust. Let me say that again. It is an active, ongoing trust relationship with Jesus Christ that has transformed their lives and continues to transform them. The faith that he is talking about is a faith that energizes spiritual work. Spiritual work, amen. It's not just something that you hold in your mind. It's not something that you just believe and check off a box and put on the wall. No, this is an active trust relationship with Jesus Christ that brings transformation to every part of your life. Amen. And the reason it is so powerful is because it is more than just an idea to comprehend, but it is a trust connection to a person who is powerful. It is connection to Jesus Christ, the divine, amen. And it changed their perspective. It changed their desires and their affections, amen. Can I just say, if you have true faith in Christ, it is going to bring a transformation to every part of your life. Amen. You're not going to just believe it and put it on a shelf and keep on doing what you've always done. Why? Because it is an active, ongoing, trust relationship with a person who is powerful and is only natural to that faith to pour itself out in works. Amen. Say it another way. We don't work for faith. We work from faith. Amen. Amen. We don't work. We don't do religious activities and try to be a good person and moral drive them according to all the moral standards. We don't work for faith. We work from faith. That is to say, we're working from a pleasure of all
Come on, right? Come on. With all that we have, with all of the knowledge, why are our lives so much like the blind people who don't know Jesus? Don't make me get specific. You know what I'm talking about. We talk the way unbelievers talk. We live the way unbelievers live. We are engaged in some of the same practices that unbelievers are practicing. And Paul would say, what kind of faith is that? The faith that I have preach to you is a faith that works itself out. Amen. It produces good works. Amen. Amen. In comparison to the little old church in Thessalonica, this infant emerging church, they had faith that produced work. They flourished. They exploded. And they became an example, a model to all the other churches in that Roman province. Amen. So that, listen, they were hearing about their faith. Amen. Ooh. Okay. They were hearing about the faith of those Thessalonians. Amen. Amen. Wow. I read that example. And I just had to ask myself, am I making changes in my life just because of my faith in Jesus? Let me ask you, what are you doing in your life right now that if it were not for your faith in Jesus, you would not be doing it? Amen? Absolutely. Amen. What do we do simply because it's an outworking of our trust relationship with Jesus? So we have to say, you know what? The only reason I'm going to apologize to them. Let's pray in your favor. Amen. That's real. My faith in Jesus. Okay, no, this is my faith walking itself out right now. Amen. Amen. Yes. The only reason I'm not going with them anymore, yes. the only reason I'm not going to that place anymore, is not because I don't still like it, it's not because it's not still tempting, but my faith in Jesus is causing me to work it out and move in a different direction. Salvation and conversion 
love life that will cause you to extend yourself to the point of straining. Not convenience. Not to have nothing else going on a Sunday. Amen. Amen. Good preacher like that. Amen. <laughs> but I put Jesus first place in priority. Amen. Even when it's hard to do it. Even when I'm exhausted. Amen. Come on. Come on. Anybody have an exhausting Saturday? Anybody have an exhausting week? But yet we're here. Amen.
interests ahead of their own. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. How are we imitating? Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. He put your needs ahead of his own. His, your interest ahead of his own. Amen. Amen. He died on the cross. It wasn't for him. It was for us. Philippians 4, 2, or Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. That don't even sound American. That don't even sound American. Consider others better than myself. Amen. Brother Zach, you ain't better than me. <laughs> What? Right? Sister, you're not better than me. You mean better than myself. He's not talking about your identity. He's talking about your priority. He's talking about your priority. If it comes down to blessing and serving and helping my brother, my sister, or my own, my own need and my own thing, guess what he says? Put others better than yourself. Ahead of your own. Listen, that's countercultural. That's contrary to our nature. We don't do that naturally. We need a true conversion, a transforming experience and salvation in order to truly do that. Amen? Amen. Only God can produce a heart in which we put others ahead of ourselves. Where we're spending our time to bless somebody else. Where we spend our energy to help somebody else. Our time and energy and efforts to pray for somebody, to offer practical support to another brother or sister. Amen. Amen. And can I just say, if we're not doing that, it's not a lack of time. It's not a lack of time. Paul says it's a lack of love. There's not enough love. There's not enough of putting yourself low and lifting someone else's knee first. Because I hear that great saint, Valerie Coley, whispering in my ear, who more than once said to me, Earl, we always have time, money, and energy for what we want to have, time, Money and energy for. This is that something else is higher on the priority scale with my time, with my money, and with my energy. Amen. Paul says that one of the signs of true conversion is love that labors. What would happen among us if we began to labor for one another? Put ourselves aside so that God's blessing would be. Promoted in somebody else's life. Amen. I believe that God would get behind that. Amen. Amen. He would bless that. He would cause us to flourish. Not only as a body, but those of us that labor to put others in. God, he, he's got your back. He knows, he's going to help you. He's going to bless you as well. Amen. Amen. Love that labors. I can't leave this point without to say, kind of the flip of that is also true. That love requires labor. <laughs> Amen. Love requires labor. Amen. See, our culture defines love as something that you feel. And when it's no longer comfortable, it's no longer convenient, or I don't feel love, then I'm justified to move on from it. Our culture teaches that. They have no concept of the idea that true love. Come on, it only begins when it gets hard. It only begins when you're sacrificing. When there's, a, when there's a conflict between you and demonstrating love in such a way that benefits somebody else and what you want to do, that's where love starts. Come on, you have to love and care for those kids. <laughs> and they don't even recognize the sacrifice you make. They keep on sinning. Amen. Come on. Can I just say that's where love begins? Go, oh, your spouse needs some help, they need some attention. Be careful. And you're tired. <laughs> Amen. God's word. <laughs> Love begins <laughs> when you do it in spite of what you feel like doing or where you want to go. Amen. <laughs> you're coming hard for a hard day at work. Amen. <laughs> you don't want to serve. You don't want to help. You want to support. You want somebody to serve you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
your caretaker. In your caretaker. For somebody who raised you. Or harder yet, didn't raise you. Didn't put in time. Didn't invest in emotional energy. But now that faith that has to work itself out and, and be motivated by a love that labors is called upon you to serve them, to support them. Amen. Can I tell you, Paul would applaud you. He would say that is a love that is, that is working itself out by laboring, by serving. It's a love that labors, and that is a sign of true conversion. Amen. That God is working with that in our heart. Amen. 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 Who is it that we need to love to the point of labor? Somebody in our family? Maybe somebody that's dependent upon us? Yes. True conversion is something that causes us to love in such a way that labors. One other thing I see here from Paul in his commendation to this model church. He said they had a faith that works. They had a love that labors. And then he said they also had a hope that endures. A hope that endures. Verse 3 again. We remember your work produced by faith, your labor prompted or motivated by love, and he saves us with the last and that great triad, right? Your endurance inspired by hope. Your endurance inspired by hope. And he's not just talking about hope in general. Kind of like we would say, well, I hope something happens. I hope so. Are you going to get a raise? I hope so. Right? He's not talking about that kind of hope. He says, this is hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He's talking about a specific kind of hope that produces endurance. It has a eschatological tone to it. What is that? An end times tone to it. He's talking about a specific hope. You see, the great triad of Christian virtue that's presented in 1 Thessalonians and in this verse, which is faith, love, and hope. He, he talks about that in many other places, but that triad in particular, he describes it all throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians. In fact, there's whole sections that deal with each of those. If you look in your grace group guide, one of the questions, I give you those passages for your study if you'd like to look at them. But in the section that has to do with hope, he points out specifically what he's referring to. He's talking about what we as believers call the blessed hope. The blessed hope. The hope of our Lord's soon return. Amen. Amen. The rapture of the church. Amen. Amen. Come on, we don't hear about that in church too much anymore. Why? Because we want God to give us everything here and now. Amen. How can God bless me now? How can God give me out of this now? This all those things are great, but we need to be reminded that here and now is not our reward. Here and now is not where it's all going to make sense. Amen. And sometimes we get mad because it doesn't make sense here and now. And God is saying, no, you're trying to declare a winner at halftime. <laughs> this thing is not over yet. It's not over yet. First Thessalonians 4.13, he says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Believers, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, the rest of men who have no hope. Verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Yes. After that, we who are still alive and are left and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And then he adds his poster. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with the hope that we have that he's coming. Amen. That he's bringing his reward. Amen. The reward is not all here and now. Amen. He's already 
reminding them of their hope in Jesus. And they've only been in a church about a year Amen. at this point. But yet they were already in need of having their hope bolstered and reinforced. Why? Because it was hard following Jesus. It was counter to the culture. Amen. They were ostracized. They were persecuted. They were saying, you know what, this is not making it easier, Paul. It's making it harder. And Paul says, don't worry about it. This is not your hope. Your hope is coming. Your hope is ahead. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Yeah. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I've got those things that don't feel like temporary or light. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. Some of us are still going through things that don't seem temporary or light. But Paul has caused us to raise our perspective. Amen. To look beyond just below the sun. Amen. That's the writer of Jesus has to say. And get a perspective above the sun. Amen. Above your lifetime. Above what you're going through right now. Begin to order your actions and your thoughts in perspective to the priorities of eternity. He says that's going to give you hope that will help you endure. Amen. Because it doesn't seem light now, but it will be light in comparison to the weight of glory and reward. Just think, as heavy as what you're going through now feels, the weight of his glory and reward will make what you're going through now seem light. Amen. That's our hope. That's what helps us endure the ridicule, being taken advantage of. Amen. Being passed over, mistreated. Amen. Come on, you, got, you don't have to try to balance all those skills now. I know some of us try. We don't have to balance those skills now. He's going to reward us. I was raised in a song that said, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I cannot be at home in this world anymore. I tell you what, I look at the news of that. I, that chord takes my heart. I don't belong here. I don't belong in this world. My reward is not in this world. Amen. Amen. I'm holding on to something greater. Yes, sir. Something better. Amen. And what allows me to do that is the fact that there's been a true transformation of my heart. Amen. I am the same You know what you've heard of. Amen. 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 And so the work of God's grace in us Amen. is that it produces faith that works. It produces love that labors. And it produces hope that endures no matter what it is like now. Yeah. Yeah. Father, thank you so much for this time in the Word. Thank you, Lord, for the time of fellowship and Lord, the prayer that we've been able to enjoy. And I just pray right now for every one of my friends, my brothers and sisters in this room, God, that you would search our heart. Lord, examine us, Lord, to see if we are truly in the faith, if we possess those virtues, Lord God, that give demonstration of true conversion. Lord, we don't want to be religious, Lord God, and not be converted, yeah. be saved. Lord, we don't want to be moral and be fortified in our, by our morality in the mistaken belief that we don't need a Savior. Lord, search our hearts, Lord God. Help us to demonstrate those great works of grace, faith, love, hope, in such a way that others can look at us and they can hear about our faith. Even when it's difficult, even when it's costly to love, that the 
evidence of our faith is clear by what we do. Lord, let that be the reality of our hearts. With every hand down here, back close, I just want to make the appeal. Maybe there's somebody in this room and you've never yielded your life to Christ. This I grew up in the sins of God church and was unsaved in that sins of God church for the first 16 years of my life. So just because you're in church does not mean that you know Christ as Savior. And so I don't want to miss the opportunity to offer to you if you've never received Christ and you'd like to know Him as Savior and Lord as the one who paid the price for your sin and offers you salvation. Would you just quickly slip your hand up and write that down and say, Pastor, pray for me. Would there be anyone here? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I need Jesus. I need a Savior. Hallelujah. Even though they're watching online, right where you are, you can receive Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray with us, lead us in a brief prayer of repentance and faith right now. And if you feel that that's you this morning, you need to make things right between you and God, I just want to invite you to pray with us. Uh, even if you're online, watching online, wherever you are, let's just pray this prayer together in repentance and faith towards the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning and I acknowledge that I am a sinner. That my sin has separated me from you. That I can never be good enough to deserve your forgiveness. But Jesus, I believe you took my place on the cross. Suffered the Father's wrath in my place. And so I put my trust in you. I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me. Give me a brand new heart. From this moment forward, make me your child. And help me to follow you. May my life demonstrate.